and welcome to MVKM Models. Today we're going to talk about the Junkers JU87 Stuka dive bomber. However, um, just a quick word about where I live in the UK and uh, about what's uh, been built here over the years. I'm in the city of Bristol, which is in the southwest of England in the United Kingdom or Great Britain, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's an aircraft city and has been for nearly a hundred years. The Bowfighter and the Blenheim were built here by the Bristol Airplane Company and also the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine was built here during World War II. Uh, now, um, the local uh, regiment for the army, uh, an infantry regiment, were the Gloucestershire Regiment, now the Rifles. Uh, the Gloucestershire Regiment uh, at the um, withdrawal to Dunkirk didn't stop fighting until the Germans were on, literally on the roof of their bunkers. The Gloucesters were on the second wave of D-Day and also they served in uh, the Korean War where they were completely surrounded and later taken prisoner with um, some of the members of the regiment. Uh, being held for two years in solitary confinement. So it's a very famous city. The story Treasure Island was set here and famous Bristolians are Blackbeard the Pirate and Cary Grant the Actor. So Bristol uh, is a very famous city. The same ship shape in Bristol fashion comes from here and also the saying of uh, paying on the nail from is from here. So my accent is local to the city and it would be the accent of the people who have built the famous warbirds from here and the famous uh, uh, aircraft engines from here over the years. So with that said, let's crack into the JU-87. The Junkers JU-87 or Stuka was a German dive bomber and ground attacked aircraft. Designed by Hermann Pohlmann, it first flew in 1935. The JU-87 made its combat debut in 1937 with the Luftwaffe's Condor Legion during the Spanish Civil War of 1936 to 1939 and served in Axis forces in World War II, 1939 to 1945. The aircraft is easily recognisable by its inverted gull wings and fixed spatted undercarriage. Upon the leading edges of its fared main gear legs were mounted ram air sirens known as Jericho trumpets, which became a propaganda symbol of German air power and of the so-called Blitzkrieg victories of 1939 to 1942 as well as providing Stuka pilots with audible feedback as to speed. The Stuka's design included several innovations, including automatic pull-up dive brakes under both wings to ensure that the aircraft recovered from its attack dive, even if the pilot blacked out from the high G-forces. The JU-87 operated with considerable success in close air support and anti-shipping roles at the outbreak of World War II. It led air assaults in the invasion of Poland in September 1939. Stukas proved critical to the rapid conquest of Norway, the Netherlands, Belgium and France in 1940. Though sturdy, accurate and very effective against ground targets, the Stuka was, like many other dive bombers of the period, vulnerable to fighter aircraft. During the Battle of Britain of 1940 to 1941, its lack of manoeuvrability, speed and defensive armament meant that it required a heavy fighter escort to operate effectively. After the Battle of Britain, the Luftwaffe deployed Stuka units in the Balkans campaign, the African and the Mediterranean theatres, and in the early stages of the Eastern Front War, where it was used for general ground support as an effective specialised anti-tank aircraft and in an anti-shipping role. 
Once the Luftwaffe lost air superiority, the Stuka became an easy target for enemy fighter aircraft. It was produced until 1944 for a lack of a better replacement. By 1945, ground attack versions of the Fokker Wolf FW-190 had largely replaced the Ju-87, but it remained in service until the end of the war in 1945. Germany built an estimated 6,000 Ju-87s of all versions between 1936 and 1944. Early design, the JU-87's principal designer, Hermann Pohlmann, held the opinion that any dive bomber design needed to be simple and robust. This led to many technical innovations, such as the retractable undercarriage being discarded in favour of one of the Stuka's distinctive features. It's fixed and spatted undercarriage. Pohlmann continued to carry on developing and adding to his ideas and those of Dippel in Karl Plauf and produced the JUA48, which underwent testing on the 29th of September 1928. The military version of the JUA48 was designated the JUK47. After the Nazis came to power, the design was given priority. Despite initial competition from the Henschel HS-123, the German Aviation Ministry turned to the designs of Hermann Pohlmann of Junkers and co-designer of the K-47, Karl Plauf. During the trials with the K-47 in 1932, the double vertical stabilizers were introduced to give the rear gunner a better field of fire. The main and what was to be the most distinctive feature of the Ju-87 was its double spar inverted gull wings. After Plauf's death, Pullman continued the development of the Junkers dive bomber. The JUA48 registration DITOR was originally fitted with a BMW 132 engine producing 450 kilowatts, 600 horsepower. The machine was also fitted with dive brakes for dive testing. The aircraft was given a good evaluation and exhibited very good flying characteristics. Ernst Udet took an immediate liking to the concept of dive bombing after flying the Curtis F-11C Goshawk. When Walter Weaver and Robert Ritter von Grehm were invited to watch Udet perform a trial flight in May 1934 at the Jutabog artillery range, it raised doubts about the capability of the dive bomber. Udet began his dive at 1,000 metres, 3,300 feet, and released his 1 kilogram 2.2 pounds bombs at 100 meters 330 feet barely recovering and pulling out of the dive the chief of the Luftwaffe commanding officer Walter Weaver and secretary of state for aviation Erhard Milch feared that such high level nerves and skill could not be expected of average pilots in the Luftwaffe nevertheless the development continued at Junkers Udet's growing love affair with the dive bomber pushed it to the forefront of German aviation development. Udet went so far as to advocate that all medium bombers should have dive bombing capabilities, which initially doomed the only dedicated strategic heavy bomber design to enter German frontline service during the war years. The 30 meter wingspan <coughs> Henkel HE-1177A into having an airframe design that could perform medium angle dive bombing missions until Reichsmarschall Hermann Goring exempted the HE-1177A Germany's only operational heavy bomber in September 1942 from being given the task of such a mismatched mission profile for its large airframe. 
Evolution, the design of the JU-87, had begun in 1933 as part of the Stutz bomber program. The JU-87 has to be powered by the British Rolls-Royce Kestrel engine. Ten engines were ordered by Junkers on the 19th of April 1944 for 20,514 pounds, two shillings and six months. The first JU-87 prototype was built by AB Flying Industry in Sweden and secretly bought to Germany in late 1944. It was to have been completed in April 1935, but due to the inadequate strength of the airframe, construction took until October 1935. The mostly complete JU-87-6 took off for its maiden flight on the 17th of December 1935. The aircraft was later given the registration D-U-B-Y-R. The flight report by Houtman Willy Neuhofen stated that the only problem was the smaller radiator, which caused the engine to overheat. The JU-87 Mark VI powered by a Rolls-Royce Kestrel V12 cylinder liquid cool engines and with a twin tail crashed on the 24th of January 1936 at Klutsch near Dresden, killing Junkers chief test pilot Willy Neunhofen and his engineer Heinrich Kreft. The square twin fins and rudders pre proved too weak they the aircraft crashed after it entered an inverted spin during the testing of the terminal dynamic pressure in a dive. The crash prompted a change to a single vertical stabilizer tail design to withstand strong forces during a dive. Heavy plating was fitted along with the brackets riveted to the frame and longer on to the fuselage. Other early additions included the installation of hydraulic dive brakes that were fitted under the leading edge and could rotate 90 degrees. The RLM was not still not interested in the JU-87 and was not impressed that it relied on a British engine. In late 1935, Junkers suggested fitting a DB600 inverted V12 engine with the final variant to be equipped with the Jumo 21210. This was accepted by the RLM as an interim solution. The reworking of the design began on the 1st of January 1936. The test flight could not be carried out for over two months due to a lack of adequate aircraft. The 24th of January crash had already destroyed one machine. The second prototype was also beset by design problems. It had its twin stabilizers removed and a single tail fin installed due to fears over stability. Due to a shortage of engines, instead of a DB600, a BMW Hornet engine was fitted. All these delays set back testing until the 25th of February 1936. By March 1936, the second prototype, the V2, was finally fitted with the Jumo 210AA engine, which a year later was replaced by a Jumo 210G. The testing went well and the pilot flight captain Hesselbach praised its performance. However, Wolfram van Richthoven, in charge of developing and testing new aircraft in the uh, Technisches Amt or Technical Service, told the Junkers representative and the construction office chief engineer Ernst Zindel that the JU-87 stood little chance of becoming the Luftwaffe's main dive bomber, as it was underpowered in his opinion. On the 9th of June 1936, the RLM ordered cessation of the development in favour of the Heinkel HE-118, a rover design. Uday cancelled the order the next day and development continued. On the 27th of July 1936, Uday crashed the HE-118 prototype, HE-118V1DUKYM. That same day, Charles Lindbergh was visiting Ernst Heinkel, Heinkel, so Heinkel could only communicate with Uday by telephone. According to this version of story, Heinkel warned Uday about the preparer's fragility. 
Uday failed to consider this, so in a dive, the engine oversped and the propeller broke away. Immediately after this incident, Uday announced to Stuka the winner of the development contest. Refinements, despite being chosen, the design was still lacking and drew frequent criticism from Wolfram von Richthofen. Testing of the V4 prototype, a GAU 87A0 in early 1937, revealed several problems. The JU-87 could take off in 250 metres or 820 feet and climb to 1,875 metres or 6,152 feet in 8 minutes with a 250 kilogram, 550 pounds bomb load and its cruising speed was 250 kilometres an hour. 160 miles an hour. Richthofen pushed for a more powerful engine. According to the test pilots, the Heinkel HE50 had a better accelerate, acceleration rate and could climb away from the target area much more quickly. Avoiding enemy ground and air defences, Richthofen stated that any maximum speed below 350 kilometres per hour, 220 miles an hour, was unacceptable for those reasons. Pilots also complained that navigation and power plant instruments were mixed together and were not easy to read, especially in combat. Despite this, pilots praised the aircraft's handling qualities and strong airframes. These problems were to be resolved by installing the DB600 engines, but de delays in development forced the installation of the Jumo 210D inverted V12 engine. Flight testing began on the 14th of August 1936. Subsequent testing and progress fell short of Richthofen's hopes, although the machine speed was increased to 280 km per hour, 170 miles per hour at ground level and 290 km per hour, 180 miles per hour at 1,250 meters, 4,100 feet while I'm maintaining its good handling ability. Basic design based on the B series. The JU87 was a single engined all metal cantilever monoplane. It had a fixed undercarriage and could carry a two person crew. The main construction, uh, construction material was duralumin and the External coverings were made of duralumin sheeting. Parts that were required to be of strong construction, such as the wing flaps, were made of Pantel, a German aluminium alloy containing titanium as a hardening element, and its components of electron, bolts and parts that were required to take heavy stresses were made of steel. Now, on a personal level, I'm going to come in here because I'm reading lots of data out. Um, when I was an apprentice, I was an apprentice at Rolls-Royce, okay, making um, military engines during the Cold War, and I later worked at British Aerospace as an aircraft fitter. Now, I've used many of these materials. We used to use uh, duralumin to dress welds and various other um, techniques on sheet metal parts of combustion chambers, and also I work with titanium. So... Um, the, I, I will say duralumin um, is a, a very good metal because if you, say, hit a dent out with it, it doesn't leave a, a mark on the what you're dressing out. Dressing is um, fashioning. Um, it, it's beating, but it's fashioning and making good. All right, so... Um, duralumin and titanium, um, these, these were, uh, this is cutting edge technology. I have used these materials and they are very good. Now to have your uh, main construction mirror material, which was duralumin, is, is, is quite something. Okay. The JU-87 was fitted with detachable hatches and removal co coverings to aid in these maintenance and overhaul. The designers avoided welded welding parts wherever possible, preferring molded and cast parts instead. Large frame segments were interchangeable as a complete unit which increased speed of repair. This is a good design. Um, 
you can get stresses go on to welds um, cracks can appear and it could cause um, instability within the airframe so this this is a very very forward cutting edge design the airframe was also subdivided into sections to allow transport by road or rail the wings were of a standard Junkers double wing construction this gave the JU87 considerable advantage on takeoff even at a shallow angle. Large lift forces were created through the aerofoil, reducing takeoff and landing runs. In accordance with the Aircraft Certification Center for Stress Group 5, the JU87 had reached the acceptable structural strength requirements for a dive bomber. It was able to withstand diving speeds of 600 kilometers per hour, 370 miles per hour, and a maximum level speed of 340 kilometers per hour, 210 mile an hour, near ground level, and a flying weight of 4,300 kilogram, 9,500 pounds. Performance in the diving attack was enhanced by the introduction of dive brakes under its wings, uh, which doubled its sirens, which allowed the JU87 to maintain a constant speed and allow the pilot to steady his aim. It also prevented the crew from suffering extreme G-forces and high acceleration during pullout from the dive. The fuselage had an overall cross-section and housed, in most examples, a Junkers UMO 211 water-cooled inverted V12 engine. The cockpit was protected from the engine by a firewall ahead of the wing centre section where the fuel tanks were located. At the rear of the cockpit the bulkhead was covered by a canvas cover which could be bre uh, breached by the crew in an emergency enabling them to escape into the main fuselage. The canopy was split into two sections and joined by a strong welded steel frame. The canopy itself was made of plexiglass and each compartment had its own sliding hood for the two crew members. The engine was mounted on two main support frames that were supported by two, two tubular struts. The frame structure was triangulated and emanated from the fuselage. The main frames were bolted onto the engine's top quarter. In turn, the frames were attached to the firewall by universal joints. The firewall itself was constructed from asbestos mesh with dual seats on both sides. All conduits passing through had to be arranged so that no harmful gases could penetrate the cockpit. The fuel system comprised two fuel tanks between the main forward and rear spars of the inner and hedral wing section. So dihedral, the wings are going up, okay? Anhedral, the wings are coming down. Um, I, I will tell you, many years ago, I had to, uh, when I was apprentice, um, do an investigation job because I, I can't say too much, but an anhedral jet aircraft um, went into it was before it went into the roll and the pilot had ejected and the, the aircraft had gone down in the sea so anhedral aircraft have a an issue with roll because um, the uh, within the theory of flight dihedral is more natural for an aircraft than anhedral so when it's anhedral which means the wings are pointing downwards it always wants to literally turn turtle all right okay the tanks also had a predetermined limit which if passed would warn the pilot via a red warning light in the cockpit the fuel was injected by way of a pump from the tanks to the engine should this shut down, it can be pumped manually using a hand pump on the fuel cock armature. The power plant was cooled by a 10 litre 2.6 US gallon ring shaped aluminium water container situated between the propeller and the engine. A further container of 20 litres 5.3 US gallon was positioned under the engine. So that's a lot of the main data about the JU-887 Stuka bomber. I don't profess to be an aircraft expert.
paper. I was a, an apprentice with Rolls-Royce Aero Engines Division and I was an aircraft fitter with British Aerospace. I worked with guys who worked on all the famous warbird, warbirds, the Blenheims, the boat fighters, sea fires. One guy I worked with, he worked on the aircraft at Uxbridge that were used in the film The Dam Busters when he was in the Royal Air Force. And then he was an inspector at aerospace in later life. So, but I don't present, pro, uh, profess to be an aircraft buff. I'm going to leave it to you guys. If you know better than me, please fight it out. Well, <laughs> pleasantly, I don't mean nastily. Please, um, Discuss it and uh, chew the fat in the comments below. And if anything I've left out, I would be absolutely delighted to hear from you. Always remember, I'm the guy who's only worked on these things. You're the experts on aircraft data. All right. So thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And until next time.